let's come around the Word of God and um, we are up to sermon number four in this series that I've been preaching, um, which has the title, What's Wrong With Sin? So we know that the Bible has certain things that it describes uh, as sin and really to kind of the point of the series was to have a look at that and say, well, well, why are these certain things sin? Why is God against certain things that otherwise might, I mean, some are obvious, like murder, uh, you know, that you could see why that would be wrong, why that would be sin, but other things perhaps not quite so obvious. And I think that maybe uh, one of the things we're going to look at today might be uh, not quite so obvious. So um, I'm going to read to you again from our text, which we've been using, which is in Mark chapter 7, and um, from verse 21. While you're just finding your place in your Bible, uh, I'm just going to come before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just pray, Lord, that you would help me as I come to preach your <coughs> word this morning. Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit. Lord, that you would guide me. Lord, that you would give me a, a, a zeal for the things of God. Lord, that you would stir up within me uh, the gift that you have put there. I pray, Lord, that Jesus Christ will be honoured and glorified and that he alone would receive all the glory this morning. Pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would enlighten our eyes. Lord, that we might see the truth and also that we might take it and apply it to our own hearts uh, and to our own lives Lord that we might live lives that are pleasing in your sight and that glorify your name in Jesus name Amen so the text we're looking at is Mark chapter 7 and I'm going to read to you from verse 21 for from within out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts adulteries fornications murders thefts covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. So this morning we're going to look at two of those um, evil things um, and they are covetousness and theft and so it's good always good to kind of define your terms before you start to to expound on a subject so i'm going to give you a definition of these things so covetousness is the desire the wanting of something that belongs to somebody else and we can see how the bible uh, clarifies this in Exodus 20 verse 17 in what we call the Ten Commandments uh, so it says thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house thou shalt not covet his thy neighbor's wife nor his manservant nor his ox nor his ass nor anything that is thy neighbor's and whilst you know not many of us have probably got a desire for a donkey um, <laughs> I think, I think it is probably true to say that you can kind of transport those ideas into a more modern equivalent, which might be something like, I want that person's car. That car's better than my car. That's a brilliant car. I really want that car. Why should he have that car? I want it. I want to have, uh, well, for our case, windows that work properly. Oh, yeah. I want to have all the kind of things that he's got. Space. Space, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I want to have the luxury that that person's got. Or, I want that person's house. Why do I have to have a house like this? I want a nice house. They've got a nice house. Why don't I get a nice house? Or, yes, I want that person's wife. Or, I want that person's husband. That is covetousness. Right? And, and what's interesting about it is, you know... What's wrong with that, really? You know, doesn't covetousness take place in the mind? I mean, I mean, I could be absolutely riddled with constant seething covetousness, and and nobody would know about it. 
you know, I could just keep it to myself. Nobody would know except me and God. And therefore, what harm is that doing? Why is that sin? You know, and if it is sin, well, what's wrong with it? So I'm going to kind of be thinking about those things this morning. Why is that wrong? Why is that something that God condemned? Why is that something that the Bible says defiles a person? It makes them unclean. And the second word that we're going to be defining this morning is the word theft. Now the Cambridge uh, English Dictionary defines theft as the act of dishonestly taking something that belongs to someone else and keeping it. Okay, so, so both, both covetousness and theft are sins, according to the Lord Jesus. And both of those things defile us and they make us um, unclean. Now when it comes down to theft, you might say, well, yeah, I could, you know, I could see why that would be wrong. You know, I would never take something that belongs to someone else and keep it. But it, it might not be as obvious as just sort of you know, picking a pocket or breaking and entering, things that we think of perhaps as, as theft. Um, it might not be that obvious. In the Bible's account of Zacchaeus, do you remember where he account, encountered the Lord Jesus in Luke uh, 19? Um, we, we get a little insight into the life of Zacchaeus. Let's have a look at that. Luke chapter 19. Luke 19. And you'll recall that Zacchaeus is a short guy. He's a little guy. And he hears that Jesus is coming along and he wants to get a, a good view of Jesus. And because all the crowds of the people are all pushing in, all waiting to see Jesus, and Zacchaeus is so short, he can't see anything. So he gets this idea that he's going to climb up into um, a sycamore tree in order to get a good view of the Lord Jesus. And, and not really expecting Jesus to say anything to him, he's quite surprised uh, in verse 5 where it says that Jesus uh, came to the place and he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house and he made haste and he came down and received him joyfully so it was unexpected wasn't it? it was a bit of a surprise and sometimes you know God can surprise us like that we, we think we know what the future holds we think we know uh, what life is like but sometimes God can really break into your life and surprise you the Lord Jesus can say to you right I'm coming to your house metaphorically you know right I, I've seen you I want to talk to you. Sometimes the Spirit of God does that, and that's a wonderful thing uh, when when He does. So let's pick it up in verse in verse eight. It says, "And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord." So this is this is this is Zacchaeus now uh, repenting, turning to the Lord Jesus. Behold, Lord. The half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. So that's interesting, isn't it? Zacchaeus was a tax collector. Okay, that was his business. But, but what tax collectors used to do and what, what merchants as well used to do was they would... They would well, kind of cheat people, you know, out of their money. And, and in, in Proverbs um, 11, verse 1, it says, A false balance is abomination to the Lord. Now, people use that word, don't they? Abomin it's an abomination because it's such a strong word. You know, people use it uh, with regard to... Um, with regard to sodomites and people like that and they say well there it's an abomination before the Lord but here in Proverbs it's saying false uh, false weights false measures are also an abomination to the Lord why well what they used to do uh, if you were buying something and in those days maybe buy like spice 
or precious um, precious gems, something like that, and they would weigh them out for you, is they would, if they were a, an unscrupulous, dishonest merchant, they might use fake weights, right? So you'd have, have a weight that, that, that weighed so much, but actually, you know, they would tell you that's what it weighed, but it didn't. Or they would put weights underneath um, where they would be putting the, the merchandise, so, so they would kind of make it look like you were getting more than you were really getting. And so they would swindle people out of their money. You pay a lot more money for a lot less. What's that? That's theft. That's stealing, isn't it? From, you're making someone pay more money than what they're actually getting. So you're cheating them out of uh, that amount. Now, some people would say, well, that's just business. But I think here what Zacchaeus has, has realised as he's been convicted of his sin, as he's turned to the Lord Jesus, is that actually that's dishonest. And I ought to make recompense for that. I ought to actually give back to those people that I've, for want of a better word, swindled. You know, and, and to take that money off those people more than they should have been given is theft as sure as if he'd opened their purse and taken out the money himself. Let's consider for a moment, what is theft? Since theft defiles us, makes us unclean before God, that's quite an important question. What is theft? And I want us to just kind of really think, maybe a bit broader than, than you think about what, what that might be. Because the standard for the Christian, you know, God sets, sets the standard high. Doesn't it? You know, God's moral standard is very high. So taking things that are your neighbours without their permission is theft. But also, how about not returning that which we have borrowed? Somebody lends us something, we borrow it, and uh, we never give it back. Isn't that also theft? Withholding wages. Say you employ a number of people and you're not actually paying them what they've earned, withholding wages, withholding rent, withholding taxes, withholding mortgage, isn't that also theft? Because that money technically belongs to somebody else. We should be giving it to them, and we're not giving it. Not giving tithes and offerings. Uh, you know, yeah, Malachi 3 verse 8 says this, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. This is, this is God speaking through the prophet. Yet you have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In other words, how have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. So the call for the Christian is, is to be faithful in, in our giving. When it comes to theft, isn't it the case that it is simply the inevitable fulfilment, the inevitable outworking of covetousness. That, that, that thought that starts in the mind, that desire, builds up and builds up until actually you want to act that out. You want to go and take that thing which you are coveting. I want that person's wife. I want that person's husband. Then the next step is, if you like, theft. Taking that which belongs to somebody else. And the Bible gives us an account that combines not only covetousness and theft, but actually all of the sins that we have been looking at in this series. Evil thoughts, adultery, fornication, lasciviousness and murder, and all in the life, all in the life of the same person. And what, what's so bad about this is that that person is an otherwise godly man, and his name is David, and he is the king of Israel, I'm sure you're all familiar with that story. But let's have a look at it. Go to 2 Samuel. Second Samuel. 
chapter 11. And listen carefully to these words. And, and, and listen how all these things combine together. Evil thoughts, covetousness, adultery, theft and, and, and so on. And it came to pass, verse 1, after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joah and his servants with him, and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him. Bless you. And he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness. And she returned unto her house, and the woman conceived, and sent and told David, and said, I am with child. And David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. So what a situation. What a situation has happened now. Furthermore, David now starts to come up with this plan to cover his tracks, to cover what has happened. And David tries to get Uriah to lay with Bathsheba so that he might think that the child she is pregnant with is his. But when that doesn't work, he comes up with a more, uh, a more direct, a more ruthless plan. So in verse 14 uh, and 15 we read these words. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him, that he may be smitten and die. So just think about this. Here, here's Uriah. He hasn't done anything wrong. He's been loyal to David. But David, in his covetousness, desires that woman and having the authority as a king, says, bring her to me. He, he lays with her. She becomes pregnant. Then he tries to cover it up uh, by getting Uriah to lay with her. When he can't do that, he decides that the only way he can deal with this is to effectively have Uriah murdered. But he doesn't even, he doesn't even take that into his own hands and, 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 and kill him. He says, we'll arrange it like this so it looks like he's been killed in battle. So that we'll, we'll put him in the hottest part of the battle. That is in, in, in the most ferocious part of the battle. And he says, when he's there, I want everybody else to, to step back. So that he is, he is in the forefront of all the conflict and make sure that he dies. It's horrible, isn't it? Um, David's covetousness has led to adultery and murder and theft, namely the theft of Uriah the Hittite's wife. Sin begets more sin. That's how it works. Sin begets more sin. Why is covetousness so bad? Why is this strong desire of the heart to have something so bad? Because it will put it you're putting a thing or a person in the place of God. That's why it defiles us. It's because that kind of longing, that worship, mm. that desire, that, that saying, I must have this, yeah. belongs to God. It doesn't belong to things, material things. It doesn't belong to a person. Or maybe it could even be your husband or your wife where you put them in a place where, oh, this person is just wonderful, they're everything to me. Well, that's God's place. That's not a place for any uh, man or woman. That urgent desire, that love 
for something is really what, what God has placed in us for him. And it's a perversion of that desire. It, it's been sidetracked into something else. And it is so easy, you know, to get drawn into covetousness, I think. It's so easy to kind of, to have all your, your, your thoughts and affections on something. Could be a holiday, could be a car, could be, you know, it's almost limitless. But that's why John says, you know, love not the things of the world. Don't, don't set your love and your heart. But there are things that we need, you know. Uh, uh, you need somewhere to live. You need clothes to wear. You need food to eat. But, you know, and God knows that you have need of them. That's what Jesus says. God knows that you need these things. But take no thought for your life. Don't become obsessed about these things. Don't think, if only I had this, I'd be happy. If only I had this house. If only I had this job. If only I had this husband, wife. Everything would be brilliant. Everything would be wonderful. I'd have peace. I'd have joy. No, that comes from God. It's God who gives those things. Mm. You know, don't, don't make that mistake of putting those things in place of God. And, and if you do that, if you put that thing in place of God, then you've given place to sin in your life. You have allowed your flesh to sit upon the throne of your life. And that will drive you, well, possibly drive you to theft, to actually taking that thing for yourself. Because I must have it. There's no stronger desire than the desire of the flesh. The only stronger desire we have is when our spirit is in relationship with God. When, the, when we allow the Holy Spirit to move in our lives. And, and, and the only one who can fulfill that desire, that want, that need, is God himself. Because it's God who's put it there um, within us. David's covetousness led to adultery murder and theft what starts as an unchecked notion morphs into evil thoughts you ever had that where a thought comes into your mind you all get it sometimes you're distracted with something a little thought enters your mind and you have to weigh it up against god's word you have to as a good steward of your mind look at that thought and think should that be there is that healthy is that profitable to have that thought in my mind should i be taking that thought captive and making it obedient to christ an unchecked notion morphs into an evil thought then that thought pleases the flesh other thoughts are gathered together and a plan starts to take shape and a strategy to take the object of our Desire. You can see it so clearly, can't you, uh, in, in 2 Samuel, in the life of King David. A plan that will uh, satisfy our flesh and maybe even excuses uh, for our sin. But they are not valid excuses before God. In Psalm 51, we see... What happens after David has been confronted by his sin? Remember what happens? Uh, Nathan the prophet comes and confronts David with sin. And he tells this wonderful little story. Uh, it's so clever the way that the Lord speaks through the prophet. And he, he tells David that uh, there was a man who had this little sheep. And he loved the sheep. It was like one of his family. And a rich man came along. And he desired uh, for a feast to take a lamb from his flock. And he took this one man's poor, poor sheep, uh, the only one that he had. And, and remember what happened, David becomes incensed. And he says, you know, who is this man? This man must be punished. He must pay for this. And the prophet says to him, thou art the man. Mm. You know, I just kind of centers... Uh, all that conviction upon the sin, on the sin that he tried to kind of not think about, tried to move forward uh, and, and not admit to himself 
that he'd done this terrible thing. But when he realizes what he's done, when he realizes actually, I am the man, I am the one who did that. I am the one who coveted, who murdered, who committed adultery, and so on. And David acknowledges his guilt. And that's the beginning. That's how you get out of this. That's how you overcome uh, this, this guilt, this, this condemnation. He, first of all, is to acknowledge our guilt. That's what Zacchaeus did, wasn't it? He said, look, if I've done this, I'm going to pay them back. I'm not just going to pay them back what they owe. I'm going to pay them fourfold what, what I took from them. In Psalm 51, David acknowledges his guilt. He says that God is, quote, justified when he speaks against David and against his sin. And that God is clear of any wrongdoing when God judges his sin. That's, that's the only way out of this. With all of these sins that we've looked at. Is first of all to admit and acknowledge guilt for sin. Say God you're right. I have done these things. God you're right. I have coveted in my heart. And, and I acknowledge that. And therefore you would be justified if you accused me. You would be justified if you judged me. But I want you to notice something about the character of God in his dealing with uh, King David. And it comes right at the start of Psalm uh, 51. And it's the ground really of, uh, it's the grounds of David's repentance. It starts like this. Have mercy upon me, O God. According to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. So David is approaching God, not justifying us. I'm not saying, oh, well, God, if you hadn't put a beautiful woman there in the first place, I would never have been tempted. Or, well, it's not my fault. You know, I was lonely. Or, well, you know, Uriah probably would have died anyway. Or, you know, he doesn't make any excuse before God. But instead he says... Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness and according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. He, he approaches God with an understanding of the character of God. That God is loving. He has loving kindness. Multitudes of tender mercies. So that's the first stage is to acknowledge guilt. And the second stage is to approach God knowing that God is merciful. Covetousness and theft are sin and they do defile us, they make us unclean, but God is a gracious God. He's a gracious, merciful, loving God. And David goes on to say, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. In the Old Testament, they would take hyssop, which is like a plant, and they would dip it in the blood of a lamb, and then they would sprinkle on the altar and on the priests, and that would symbolically be, be cleansing them. It's a picture of the Lord Jesus, of the Lamb of God. Purge me with hyssop, I shall be clean. Wash me. And I shall be whiter than snow. In Acts 22 verse 16 it says, And now why tarriest thou? In other words, why do you wait? Arise and be baptised and wash away thy sins. How? By calling on the name of of the Lord. So that's how we get clean. That's how we have our sins washed away by calling on the name of the Lord. And and with this salvation, with this salvation that is in Christ alone comes power. 
With this salvation comes power. Power for living. Power to change. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labour, working with his hands, the thing which is good. Ephesians 4.28. So saying if you were a robber, if you were a thief, that's what you were before you became a believer. Now, start to work. You know, go, go and earn honest money. Don't steal it from people. Go and earn your, your wages. And then it tells you why. And I find this fascinating. It's saying, right, go and earn honest money now. Go and earn, earn your wages, not by stealing, but by labouring for them, that he may have to give to him that needeth. That's, that's a picture of the church, right? It's saying, look, you go, you earn these wages, you earn all this money, you work hard, be diligent, be a good employee, or be a good employer, however, however you're working, and, and make that money because someone might need it. Yeah, someone, might, someone else might need it. And if you've got it, you can bless them with it. Was it John Wesley used to say uh, um, that you you earn earn as much as you can, save as much as you can, in order to give as much as you can? That's why we do it, is so that I can take care not only of my own needs, but other people's needs as well. So it, it, it comes centering back in on what is it to be a Christian? What is it to live the Christian life? Well, it's that I'm re in relationship with brothers and sisters in Christ and, and the resources that I have, whether that's a gift that God has put in me, whether that's uh, uh, time or um, the, the, uh, the ability to teach the word of God or whether, yes, it's that you've got lots of money. You know, God can use those resources to bless other people to, to make sure that no one is in need, to make sure that no one is suffering. And that's part of having all things common, as it says in Acts uh, chapter 2. That's the early New Testament church. They made sure that no one was in need. Because no one said that what they had uh, was their own. They weren't selfish about it. But rather they were looking to bless other people. God's power not only saves, it cleanses. It not only cleanses, but it transforms. As the hymn writer puts it, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. Have you discovered that power yet? Have you, have you found the power that's in the blood of Christ to forgive your sins, to wash you clean, but also to empower you to take on whatever tribulation or trial or, or difficulty you have to go through? There is wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you Lord for your word. Thank you for the truth of your word and uh, just pray you would help each one of us to, to put these things into practice in our own lives. Lord, to, to think of others, to desire to walk in holiness with a clean heart, and a clean life, Lord. Pray, Lord, that you would help us to be content with what we have, Lord, not to put things, objects, materialism, other things in place of God, so that it is God that we love and desire above everything else, Lord. We ask you to, to change us, transform us, to be that people who would do that, Lord, who will put you first, who will give you the preeminence in our lives. Well, Lord, I ask you 
to help us as a fellowship, as a church, to do that, Lord, to desire to walk in true holiness, Lord, by the grace that you give, in Jesus' name. Amen.